So um, what, what does it mean to, for a website to be fast? What is performance really? We can measure the time it takes to generate and deliver the HTML. This is kind of a back end thing, but it's important because until you have that initial document, you can't download any of the resources that are referenced in it. We can talk about the time it takes to deliver all the files that make up the web page. We can talk about the time it takes to get a useful page. So maybe we haven't downloaded all the files, but it's useful, it looks decent, and you can start reading it. We can talk about the time it takes to respond to input, the time from the time you click the mouse or tap the screen to when something actually happens. We can talk about the time it takes to download new data to make an Ajax request, the time it takes for that little loading spinner to go away. Uh, and we can talk about the time it takes for a to return to a page we visited before. In other words, how much of the cache impacts your page load and how much of it will load and fresh every time. So, so what do we care about performance? Nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we care partly because it's one of the signals that Google uses in its search engine rankings. It's not as important as relevance, but it affects how your web page is ranked. It also creates a higher conversion rate. So more of your users who are casual visitors, if your experience is good and fast, could be converted into customers. Um, users take it for granted. I've had um, clients who ask us for really big projects and ask for all these features, and we deliver it to them, and they go, well, but this file is too big. Well, you didn't ask me for the file to be small. Users and clients take performance for granted. Um, which gets into the next thing, performance affects perceived quality because you kind of assume that things are going to be fast. The last thing is that performance is especially important on mobile because you have less resources, you have fewer CPU cycles, you have less bandwidth, you have a really small, unreliable cache, sometimes the cache is a breakdown reader. But at the same time, users expect more because they're busier. Um, there's also a maximum app size. So even if you are building a phone gap app with HTML5, or titanium, you still run into that limit of resources that you can provide for the app store people to say to a client, hey, you have to go on Wi-Fi to download this. That, that's a major barrier to adoption of your app. I love this quote by uh, Mike Krieger of Instagram, and he says, mobile experiences fill the gaps while we wait. Nobody wants to wait while they wait. Mobile needs to be fast. So how do websites work? Um, we can think of them like a Greyhound. The book, the O'Reilly book, High Performance Book Sites, actually has a great hand on the cover. And that's a really good method, it's a really good metaphor, because book sites tend to be fast, the best ones are lean, and they spend a lot of time running. If you have a great hand, you know that they spend even more time doing this. Right. Which makes the metaphor even better, because really, the, ideally, your web page spends most of its time doing that, and the minimal amount of time loading stuff. So that is the goal is to not only run like a greyhound, but sleep like a greyhound. So let's talk, let's talk basics. Let's talk about the basic rules of performance. Minimize HTTP requests. HTTP is an old protocol built when web pages were much simpler, and it's long time. Every time you download a resource, you have to make a connection to the server, download your resource, and then disconnect. And then the client goes through, let's say, a web page and goes, oh, there's a file in here. Let me connect to the server, get the file, disconnect. Oh, there's another file. Connect to the server, disconnect. So HTTP is a huge bottleneck, and the fewer requests you have, the better. And the next one is CSS at the top, scripts at the bottom. Scripts, uh, excuse me, CSS at the top, because you don't want to have a flash of unstyled content. You, if you put the scripts, at the, excuse me, the CSS at the bottom, your web page will progressively render without the scripts, without the CSS, and then it will, you'll snap to a view where it's styled. You don't want that. On the other hand, you want scripts at the bottom because scripts block anything else from loading. <coughs> because a script might need to write to the DOM, and if it does that, you can't have the DOM changing as the script is loading because the faster the connection is, the different, the further you'll be through the DOM. So the browser stops when it hits a script and does nothing else until that script is loaded. And then if there's a script like and partway through the page, it stops again and loads the script. Scripts block loading. Even jQuery. So most web pages have jQuery at the top. 
the benefit of that is you can write inline, inline JavaScript, and that JavaScript will be executed when the page loads. So there's not a huge benefit of it other than convenience, which is why it happens. <coughs> if you put JavaScript at the bottom, if you put including jQuery, you do have to put your scripts at the bottom. You have to put even inline scripts at the bottom, or you have to put it somewhere else and then only talk to jQuery while it's, once it's loaded. So it's a little bit less convenient, but it also forces you to write better code and it's much faster. Import, import makes puppies cry. Here's a problem with import. <laughs> import is a feature of CSS <coughs> that lets you import other CSS files. That's really handy. It makes your sites really modular. The bad thing is that the browser doesn't know it needs to download that file until it downloads the HTML file, downloads the CSS file, parses the CSS file, and then goes, oh, look, style sheets. At which point, you connect to the server, you download the style sheet, you disconnect, and so on and so forth. Finally, the last sort of basic rule is minify and combine your files. Make your files small and have as few files as possible. So for text, that means minify it, remove the spaces, remove the comments, and combine all your scripts into one file, all your CSS into one file. For images, that means put it into a sprite and run it through a tool like Smush It that compresses the images without losing quality. Um, and that's not possible for all images. Certain images, like if you need to center a background on a solid color, you might have to have that in a separate image. But as much as possible, it's best on the sprites. So some more basics. Enable GZIP. It's a setting on the server, presses files, compresses in the browser, makes things faster. Use a content delivery network. A lot of the files that you'll serve on your web page are things like web fonts, um, jQuery, jQuery libraries. These things come with free CDNs that you can use. Um, and the benefit of those CDNs provided by like Google and Microsoft is twofold. One, it's awesome and it's free. Two, it, it's likely that your users will have encountered the jQuery CDN from Google before. So for example, if they have visited Netflix, they'll have downloaded the latest version of jQuery from Google. If they then visit your site, they don't need to download that file again. They've already got it. So you get a sort of a two-fold benefit for you from using these CDNs. If you're a bigger company and you can go with a commercial CDN, like Akamai, more power to you. But even if you're a small person and all you're doing is putting together your portfolio, you too can leverage the power of CDNs. Uh, use CSS3 for images where possible. This should be a no-brainer. I know it is for a lot of front-end developers. It's not always for clients. A lot of clients want sites to look exactly the same back to like IE7. And they're not aware, they assume that that's the best case scenario. And they're not aware that either situation revol involves trade-offs. So you can have a site that uses CSS3 and is fast, or you can have a site that looks exactly the same and every browser is slow. You can penalize all browsers, or you can penalize old browsers. And I think that mindset will help sell clients on graceful degradation. Finally, watch out for a flash of unstyled content before JavaScript runs. Most JavaScript libraries, including most jQuery, runs on document writing, meaning the document's been parsed, the document's been rendered, and every single file has been downloaded. That means that there's a substantial amount of time where your DOM's kind of sitting there, your JavaScript hasn't run, but everything else is in place. So if you have JavaScript that adds a class or injects markup, make sure that it looks good before that happens. And you know, it might not look exactly the same, maybe your JavaScript is adding an image gallery, and before the image gallery loads, you reserve space for the image gallery. Little things like that improve the perceived reliability of your site. Let's talk about some essential tools that should be in the toolbox if any front-end developer concerned about performance. Uh, the network handle in a browser tool of your choice is really essential. That's what generates, if you see these little waterfall diagrams of which resources load when, that's really useful. It lets you dig into see what the HTTP requests were, and it also allows you to see what's blocking what. And best of all, it allows you to test and see if what you think improved performance actually improved performance. Why slow from Yahoo or PageSpeed from Google are both great tools that will give you like a report card on your page's performance. They'll check against really common performance issues and some really weird ones, and then tell you how you can fix your site. Those are really great tools. A slow connection simulator to simulate what it looks like when a user is connecting from far away or over 3G or it just has a slow connection. 
this is especially important if you are developing servers on your network. It's easy to take for granted that, oh, I, you know, I've got a great internet connection in my office and I'm close to my server. If you degrade your connection intentionally, you're more likely to see the sorts of problems that your users are encountering. So Fiddler is great on Windows. The connection, the network link conditioner on OS X is great. I've never used NetM as a command line tool, but I've heard it's awesome. Smartphones are important. It's really easy to assume that WebKit is WebKit is WebKit. It's not. The web Android version of WebKit is different from the iOS version of WebKit. It's different from the desktop version of WebKit. There are features that are missing. Caching is different. And it's really important to test on, if you don't have a, uh, an actual smartphone with your target platform, to at least test on an emulator. The last one, which I love, is Dropbox, which is a free file hosting service you might have used. The neat secret feature of Dropbox is you can use the public folder as a quick and dirty web server, which is fantastic because things like Ajax requests, you have to test on a server. You can't really test that over a local, a local connection. So that's really nice because you can test those things. It's also nice because it's not really designed for that, and so it's kind of slow and it's kind of crappy and gives you a pretty good feel for what might happen in the real world. So Dropbox public folder is a really nice quick and dirty test tool. All right, test time. This is not actually what my computer room looks like anymore. <laughs> <laughs> my wife is thrilled about that. Uh, so this, this presentation is a web page. I'm using Deck.js. And the great thing about Deck.js is it's modular. The bad thing about Deck.js is it's modular. And what I mean by that is there's all these plugins and themes and functions, and they're all in separate CSS and JavaScript files. This happens a lot. It's not because the people who develop these tools don't care about performance. It's because they wanted these tools to be modular. That's a totally reasonable thing to want, and it's free that I can move out and add in these files as I want. The downside is my presentation when I was building it last night took six seconds to load from Dropbox. That's obviously not a great scenario. It's probably a worst case scenario, and I haven't cached anything. But not great. You can see Modernizer is blocking things for a while. Then we get down to a bunch of the desk stuff, and it's it's downloading those things in parallel. Newer browsers. If they encounter a bunch of script tags, we'll download all those tags, all those scripts in parallel. They will not do anything else except download those scripts. And older browsers not only will they stop when they hit that tag, but they will do one at a time. So this morning, I combined and minified my CSS, and I combined my JavaScript. I couldn't minify it because it was missing some semicolons in Deck.js. And minify tools really like you to have semicolons because they are removing the white space, the new lines and the spaces from your script. So if you don't have semicolons at the end of your lines, yeah. Don't use a broken minifier. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, you gotta have the semicolons. Did you, uh -huh. see, did you see the discussion with Douglas Crockford and the guys from Twitter Bootstrap this past week? Anybody see that? I didn't see that. Oh, okay. Anyway, it was it, it was on that. It was a complete waste of time, but <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, a lot of minify tools, if they encounter a missing semicolon, will do one of two things. They'll fail and say, I can't minify that. Or they will minify it anyway and break your code. So uh, it's a potential point of failure um, and it's frustrating, so I didn't minify it. I just combined. Just doing those things and doing nothing else, still hosting on my crappy Dropbox thing, and after I clear the cache, I cut my load time. I cut it down from six seconds to three seconds. And again, that's you know, sort of our worst case scenario, but it's a little step that re removed a lot of requests. We went down from like 20 something to nine. We shaved a few bytes and we shaved half the time off. But, but why was the space not different? I think, didn't you have 680K on the previous one? <laughs> yeah, it was 600 something. I only saved a few bytes by, uh, by minifying. So it's, it's nice but the real savings is in the HTTP. Yeah, and the latencies over mobile are tripled or quadrupled, so. Yeah, Minify is like a nice thing to have, but you can live without it if you don't need it. It just spaces and comments. It's important if you have a lot of comments. Then Minify really comes in handy. So next steps. Let's load JavaScript without blocking the page. Instead of loading one JavaScript file and blocking the page then, let's not block it at all. There are a few ways to do this. The async attribute on the script tag, which isn't widely supported yet, so it's, it's cool and it'll be great once it's supported, but it's not there yet. Uh, defer does basically the same thing, except it supposedly executes your scripts, excuse me, in the order in which they appear. 
The problem is older browsers don't do that. Older browsers ex execute those scripts in whatever order they feel like. So, so that's an element. You can't load a jQuery plugin before you load a jQuery. It'll break. So um, a really good solution for that is using JavaScript to asynchronously load the script. And you'll see this in a lot of like the Google Analytics and the Facebook includes and the Google Web Fonts all will asynchronously load a JavaScript file so they don't sludge your image. This is really nice um, and it only takes a few lines to do. If you want to get really fancy, there is a great two kilobyte library called the Yupnote. And Yupnote does a few things. It asynchronously loads your JavaScript. When the page is done, it executes the JavaScript in the order it was entered in the file. And it tests and it loads JavaScript based on the results of those tests. So if you have a CSS or JavaScript file that you only use for IE7 or only use for mobile users, you can test against anything you want, a modernizer test, a media query, even just a variable. And the end note will conditionally load your scripts on there. So this is a great way to, if you have to do an IE7 specific JavaScript, don't bother the new browsers with it. Yepnip is awesome, and it's included with Modernizer. Some files really should be separate. This gets back to browser-specific fixes. You don't want new browsers to download code for old browsers. You can even get really fancy and say, um, look at user's path through the site, and say, well, this person is going to the um, consumer side of my site, but not the corporate side. So I should only load the consumer CSS when they visit the consumer page. Or ultimately, you might say, hey, the user bounces all around my site. I'm going to load everything on that first page load, combine all those files, and that way, the first page load will take a while, but after that, it will be really fast. That's sort of a judgment call based on your user's flow and how your website is constructed. CSS selectors are controversial. Some people really don't like the asterisk selector. Some people really don't like the child selector because there's a performance hit with that. Um, and there's a performance hit if you write really long selectors because CSS is parsed from right to left. And so the browser will keep going to the left until it finds you know, more matches. So uh, there, there's been some testing on this. It does have an impact. Um, one test testing worst case scenarios found a 20 to 50 millisecond impact on performance. So the lesson I get from that is don't go crazy and you'll be fine. Browsers are getting better at parsing CSS all the time. And if the browser really chokes on an asterisk, that's on the browser maker, not as us as front-end developers. So just don't go nuts and you'll be fine. Social media widgets are, look tiny but are actually huge. Because when you load that JavaScript file from the Facebook API, that script is injecting an iframe into your page. And that iframe includes images, might include more scripts, might include some CSS. And so instead of just having that one request, you have several requests. And your page isn't done loading until those requests are made. So a better thing to do, a more performant thing to do if you can swing it, is to use images. Just have an image with a Facebook logo, and you click it, and it pops up a window with the, the share link. That might be a hard thing to sell a client on. Maybe they really want, when you click the Facebook button, it says one link next to it, and they really want that tight integration. Another option is to lazy load your share buttons. So you have a picture of a share button. When the user mouses over it, the share button loads. It doesn't load if the user isn't interested in sharing, which happens probably a lot more than your client expects, and it doesn't affect the initial page load. So those two options really cut cut the fat out of social media buttons. Let's talk, let's talk JavaScript, JavaScript and jQuery. One general piece of advice, and this can go for just about anything, use only what you really need. If you need a tab bar, don't load all of jQuery UI. You'll drive yourself nuts. If you only need one feature test and modernizer, do a custom build of modernizer, pair out everything that you don't need. Um, and that even goes for, if you want to get really creative, you know, do you really need a whole library, or do you need like five lines of jQuery? The less stuff you have to load and execute, the faster your web page will be, and the, happy, the happier you're likely to be as a developer. Get elements by ID were possible. Um, the browser has a native document get element by ID call, a native function that you can call from jQuery. And if you do that, if you just use an ID in jQuery, that's what it will do. If you have a more complex selector, it's going to run custom JavaScript code to parse that and go through the document and find it, which is a lot more expensive. So whenever possible, 
find stuff by ID. If you're on mobile and you're building like a phone gap application or you're building something primarily targeted at mobile, consider an alternative like um, JQ Mobi or Zepto. These are smaller, faster alternatives. They don't have the feature set. They don't have a cross-browser compatibility. They might not be as stable, I don't know. But they are a lot leaner and meaner than jQuery. And again, if you don't need it, why use it? Vanilla JavaScript will always be easier, will always be faster. So document get element ID will always be faster than doing a jQuery selector. Because jQuery is going to have to parse that selector and go, oh, you want to get an element by ID? OK, I'll do that. But in that time, you've lost, you've lost cycles. Um, similarly, jQuery each is slower than just looping through elements. And most of the time, like CSS, you just don't go next and you'll be fine. But if you have large collections of elements, it might be worth considering writing it in vanilla jQuery because there, there is a performance in that. Again, small, but if you go nuts, there's problems. CSS transitions are faster than jQuery animate, especially on mobile. It might not be noticeable on the desktop, but a lot of the time, if you are doing a jQuery animate function, it will be noticeably choppy on mobile. So now that's another one of the ways that you can sell CSS3 to clients by saying, hey, look, um, on my iPhone, it doesn't look as good. I want to make it look good on newer browsers and gracefully degrade on older browsers. It's not an option of supporting everything. It's a trade -off. Finally, JS Perf is really awesome for doing JavaScript performance tests. You can collaboratively crowdsource your testing. You can create a test. Other people can modify and run your test, and you can get results from all different platforms of how things run. This is also a great resource because they've got lots of existing tests on which JavaScript framework is the fastest, which way of doing things is the fastest. So if you're ever not sure, if you ever need to settle an argument, this website is awesome. So let's talk do this, not that. Um, similar to if you've ever read the books, eat this, not that, with JavaScript. So one sort of basic tip is cache or chain jQuery selectors. Like we talked about, it's really expensive for jQuery to find something. A lot of times it's going to run a regular expression match on that jQuery selector you give it. So don't do it more often than you need to. Instead, reuse that jQuery object that is returned multiple times. You can either store it to a variable, or like we're doing, just call a bunch of functions on it. It's, it's chaining, and it's a really cool feature of jQuery that's different from vanilla JavaScript that can not only save you performance and time, but actually make your code more readable. Another do this dot not that option is provide context. And I didn't realize that this until recently, but jQuery performs better when you give it a little bit of context. Because if you try to find div.awesome rather than just dot awesome, jQuery can look for all the divs in your document, narrow it down that way, and then look for class awesome. Versus if you just look for class awesome, it's going to go through that whole document. Again, I wouldn't go nuts because it probably gets worse from there on in. But if, and obviously sometimes you want anything with class awesome, but if you can swing it and if it makes sense for your application, providing contests makes jQuery that much severe. So front end development is inherently interdisciplinary. That's a belief I feel very strongly. Um, we're at the intersection of development and design. Our job is to bring designers' visions to life, to integrate really tightly with what's going on in the back end, and expose what's going on in the application in a way that is meaningful, authentic, and fast. So even though this is the Atlanta HTML5 meetup, the next thing I'm going to go into is backend performance. Server side tips. So the first one is minimize database queries. When you load a page with a standard WordPress installation, every single time you load that page, WordPress is querying databases to put that page together. The next time a person visits it, it might not have changed, but it's going to rebuild that entire web page again. A caching system, like SuperCache for WordPress, and I'm sure there are other systems for other CMSs, will prevent that. It will cache the page, and when someone visits it, it will serve a static page rather than generating it every time. Um, another option is to use a system like Jekyll that has a backend, has an application attached to it, but when you hit publish, it doesn't write to a database. It generates an HTML file. And that's really nice if you don't need dynamic features like calendars and comments. If you do, it's probably not a good thing. The, I love this quote. There are two hard things in computer science, cache and validation, naming things, and off by one occurs. 
Cache invalidation is actually surprisingly hard. It's hard in the front end, and it's hard on the back end. I uh, worked in an environment where we had a WordPress installation where we were using SuperCache, and we had a calendar widget. And the calendar widget, every time somebody added or changed an event, would go to SuperCache and say, hey, invalidate the cache, fail the new page, I changed something. And SuperCache would go, okay, and rebuild the page. That was great. The problem we ran into was that old events wouldn't disappear from the calendar. They would stay in the calendar until someone added a new event. And what was happening is that the calendar widget didn't tell the super cache to invalidate the cache every night. So we had to run a batch process to every night and validate the cache so that old events get removed from the calendar. And those are the sorts of things, because CMSs, and especially WordPress, are so modular, and plugins can do so many things, you really need to make sure that plugins know to invalidate the cache and be prepared for problems. Caching is awesome, but problems will come up. Combine and minify on the server. Um, combining and minifying every time you change a file is painful. It's painful if you use web-based tools. It's a little bit less painful if you compile, if you combine on your local computer. But it's still painful to maintain those two versions by hand. Instead, it's a lot easier to set up an environment where the files are combined and minified on the server. There are two benefits for that. One, you can actually do it because it's really tempting not to do it and save yourself some time. But two, you can get really fancy and set up a development environment where things aren't minified, so you can debug, and a production environment where they are. So that's a really nice benefit. It makes things in the long run more reliable if you, if you set that up and faster because you'll actually do it if it's not painful. Um, and that, there are tools to do that for .NET, for PHP, for Rails, for any framework that you want to work with, chances are there's a combined minify tool. Far future expires headers. When a server delivers a file to a client, it comes with a header that says, here's how long this file is good for. After this date, ask me if it's changed. But before that, don't bother, just, just hang on to it, it's good. If you get jQuery from a CDN, you'll notice that the header is like years in the future. We can do that because we've appended a query string, or I think we actually include the name of the version of jQuery in the URL. And because of that, when the version changes, it looks like a totally new file, and the browser reloads it. But jQuery 1.7.1 is never going to change. That's that version of jQuery. So it, it makes sense to have a far future expire center. And you can even do that for stuff like CSS for your own scripts, as long as you um, have in the URL the version number. So it's an area where the back-end programmer can't just turn it on, the front-end developer can't just start using it. We need to work together in order to make this happen. And when we do make it happen, it's awesome. Finally, when using JavaScript templating, if you use like Handlebars or Knockout or Backbone or any of those frameworks that fill in data for you, pre-fill static data so that you don't get a blank page while the JavaScript loads, because the JavaScript, chances are, will be the last thing to execute. If you do that, you improve perceived performance. Twitter does this. Um, if you pull up Twitter, you'll notice you immediately get your tweets. And what it's doing in the background is probably loading tweets as you need them. But even if you disable JavaScript and go to Twitter, you still get a bunch of tweets because they pre-fill the data on the server. That's a tough thing to do because you have to have back-end code doing basically the same thing that your front-end code is doing. Um, but again, it's worth it because you dramatically bump up that perceived performance factor. Let's talk about the future. Let's talk about cool things that aren't practical right now, but we're going to make things even faster, even better, even more awesome. Speedy is from Google, and it's basically a better HTTP. 